Art Group International, a group that began in March of 2022 and um, has sprung out of a previous group which started in 2007 called Art Women Who Work. Um, this is our portfolio presentation series uh, where uh, each uh, every two months uh, artist presents their work and uh, we have a discussion afterwards about it. Today, uh, we're featuring Karen LaFleur. Karen is an artist who lives in Cape Cod. Uh, that's the state of Massachusetts. She describes herself as a expressionist, digital artist, writer, and animator. And I think with no further ado, we'll just plunge right in to uh, introducing Karen LaFleur. Welcome, Karen. Pleased to have you. Hello. Delightful okay. to be here. Take it away. Terrific. Well, first of all, I want to thank Viviana for inviting me to do this presentation today. And I'd like to thank everybody that's helped make this technically possible and our guests here in the StreamYard uh, studio and those watching on the YouTube channel for Inspiration Art Group International. It's a delight to be here. So I'm going to cover a lot today. And so this is going to go pretty quickly. It's jam-packed uh, presentation here on my artwork and animation. And the first few slides that you see uh, the artwork come up, because I'm going to say this right now, because I don't want to interrupt the narrative flow, because there is text for me to read, are early pieces that I did in the 1970s and early 80s. I think the latest one was 1981. They're done in pencil, graphite, and I would use India ink as like watercolor. And it was really sort of the basis of my uh, illustrative work that eventually ended up on the computer. So with no further ado, let's go, let's proceed. So first, I'd like to start with me as I do with all my presentations. Look, there are pictures inside my hands. Well, that's nice, dear, everyone said. Just don't forget to wash them before dinner. But I didn't wash away the pictures, and they are still there. Even today. And stories, too. So the basis of my artworks, whether it's still animation, always is in this interplay between picture and word. Uh, somewhere in the background, sometimes it's just a straight uh, story written. If that's the case, I have the visuals in my head or vice versa, if it's visual, I have the written stories in my head and sometimes they get combined together. So let's start with story. Um, my artworks and writing speak to the resiliency of the human heart to survive in ever shifting landscapes thematically. And I do this by exploring the interplay between interior and exterior worlds with a focus on adaptability. Like, for instance, you speak to yourself inside your head, and yet you speak out loud verbally. You can only speak out loud a, a small fraction of what you're saying to yourself inside your head. So there's this constant balance between the inside you and the outside you going on. Now, I could start this presentation by talking about all the things I've done in my career because I've been an artist since my first breath. I've curated exhibitions, done a master's in illustration, a master's in children's literature, a, comp a computer certificate for computer graphics at RISD. And I did those three deg degrees to, again, study uh, word and image together. I've lectured at the Art Student League and many other places. I've worked with designers back in the day when they would hire artists for set designs, um, uh, store windows, uh, displays, etc. I've helped establish a video wall program, cataloged a student of Hans Hoffman for the Hans Hoffman Foundation and the Cape Museum of Art. And I've been a gallery owner for 30 years. But that's another lecture. And I could tell you about all the exhibits that I've done and the screenings. There's been over 100 exhibits and over 30 screenings of my animations. But that's another lecture. 
And I could tell you about my support of the arts in many other ways. And one has been to be uh, supportive of the Texpressionist movement. Um, this is a group of artists. Uh, it was started uh, by Colin Goldberg. Um, I joined around 2020 into the group and it's gone internationally worldwide uh, with over, I believe over 50,000 hashtags now, artists identifying themselves as Texpressionist artists. Um, and it's been a real bonus for us because as digital artists to describe yourself as a digital artist, well, they also do uh, CG for uh, movies in Hollywood under digital artists. They also do video games under digital artists, but we're approaching technology as fine artists. So Texpressionism is an artistic approach in which technology is utilized as a means to express emotional experience in our artwork. We've been listed in Wikipedia and many other publications and having this word in the lexicon to be able to dialogue about our artwork has been a wonderful thing to have and also watch grow. So check us out. I can also tell you about how I technically get my pencil drawings into the computers into a billion layers and lots of colors and how those pencil drawings go into the computer and the uh, coloring that goes on in the computer is, is highly detailed. Uh, I zoom right in on the tiniest little dot and make sure that it has its own definition. And even though the final artwork might be this size printed on um, maybe a 20 by 30 uh, digital um, archive uh, print and then framed, my artwork can be projected. And so I have seen my artwork on 60 foot tall buildings and I've also seen it on 25 foot wide screens. So the details go in in the first place so that they can be projected later and still hold their quality. But I'm not gonna talk about the techniques of that. What I'd like to talk to you about today are the fundamental elements I use in my artwork for each artwork, whether it's a flat uh, piece that's framed on the wall or an animation. These are some of the core points that I try to hit when I'm creating a, an artwork. The written backstory, the visual sequencing that comes before and after, the character, movement, and landscape. So let's start with story. The stories that I write fall in a genre called sudden fiction. Now that's sort of classified as flash fiction these days, but I was writing sudden fiction before flash fiction came onto the scene. And it's now divided into a million subgenres like micro fictions and things like that. But for me, it's a brief story under 750 words. It takes place in a single setting, told in a brief time span, contains a limited number of characters, and most importantly, it speaks with immediacy. It professes an uneasy familiarity, like I kind of get this. I can't say what it is, but I get it. And it teeters on the brink of revelation. So I started with a bunch of uh, women's voices in an exhibit called Night Driving. And they speak their inner self out from the, uh, out from the paintings. So what you're going to hear next is Terry, and Terry speaks to the um, identity confusion that can happen with motherhood, especially with my generation, where you had to give up your name when you married, and then you were mom, and then you end up with all these other identifiers. But the person you were before all these titles came on to you is a little bit lost inside. And this is Terry's story. School bus yellow picketed across kitchen wallpaper, orange juice, a carton of milk, and an empty cereal bowl with a superhero tossed and upside down, his head twisted on backwards. On the bottom of the hero's shoe, the words, not for young children, appeared stamped in blue ink. And I wondered, as the musical score to a 1930s film played from the TV screen in the living room, it had to be you, it had to be you. Yes, it had to be you. Peanut butter stains smeared the countertops, and dishes waited in the sink to be clean, but I ignored them all 
and instead walked my index and next finger in a sassy sway dance in time to the music. It had to be you up alongside the cereal bowl and peered over the rim into the curve of an upside down smile. New in the neighborhood, I asked. So this sudden fiction is about 120 words. And I also at one point was reading very, very early uh, fairy tales, way before Grimm, as close as I could get to an original oral source. And then I would read these texts and then I would put it aside and I just write whatever the, I wanted. And I would write a love story, I'd write, write a ghost story, but inevitably little elements of the story I had just read previously, the fairy tale would leak into that story. It might not come directly, but somehow it seeps in. What you're seeing here is Beauty and the Beast. Uh, when you first look, look at it, you say, well, this is, it just looks like a classic fairy tale figure. But if you look at the hand, it has a pink watch on. And nobody in Grimm's or earlier had a pink wristwatch on. If you read the text, which I don't have time to do today, in the very end, this character is reminiscing of what the miss is at home. And one of them is going on a night drive and sitting at a red light waiting for green and watching the windshield wipers go back and forth. And suddenly you re realize at the end of this story that that beast character in Beauty and the Beast is also a contemporary character who has been transformed into a fairy tale. So there's a lot you can do with text and image with a few words on one page. This here is Red Riding Hood one of my favorite versions, it's pre-1870 oral uh, Red Riding Hood from France. And uh, unlike the versions we've mostly heard, which is the woodcutter comes in and saves the day or the prince on the white horse comes and saves the damsel in distress, this Red Riding Hood tricks the wolf in the end. And as she's parting, basically says to him, if you're gonna be that stupid, I'm out of here. And I'm sitting here reading this story from 1870 going, go girl. Um, and here's the detail up close. So you can see um, a little better how each panel is drawn and how it holds together with this giant tree uh, narratively across the five panels. And I've also experimented with words, mixing them up inside the image itself. So that it's not really reading on a linear straight line across or down. It's actually going up and down according to the cadence of the text. This piece here was animated uh, a number of years back. Nancy and I did uh, for a children's literature conference at Simmons College. Um, but this is the still painting it was taken from. And recently I've been writing stories uh, about my childhood experiences in the hospitals in the um, mid to early fifties. Um, I was uh, one of those chronically seriously ill children waiting for technology to catch up so that it could save me. So I spent a lot of time in the hospital with children in the same position. Uh, we were in the critically ill ward. Uh, and in those days, the most you would get, even if you were there for months on end, was a pad of paper and a pencil. And if you were very, very lucky, you got a deck of cards. There was no therapy dog. There was no playroom. There was no television. There was nothing other than ourselves. And what we did was we created our own worlds and we became children in the middle of chaos, in the middle of crisis. We still laughed, we still played. In fact, I think we drove the hospital staff crazy with what we did. I cannot tell you on a recorded presentation what we did, <laughs> but it was pretty wild. And so these stories come out about the humanity of children and how they experience trauma. And I want you to look at the first title, Gyroscopic Lullaby. And what I'm gonna do is play an animation in the next slide to this story. There is an elderly woman and she was thinking back on this group of stories and these children that she met throughout her childhood. And the first child she talks about is Melinda. 
And Melinda is based on a young girl. She was maybe 10 years old. I was eight at the time. And she was in a giant gyroscopic globe. And she had a back situation and they would rotate her around. So if she was upside down, we laid on the floor and played cards with her. <laughs> and so the story goes. This is the introduction to Melinda. See if I can get this to run for you. Sometimes if I lie on my back in a very quiet room, I can hear the gears of her spin in the darkness. I can hear the soft shift of fabric as she turns inside her gyroscopic globe. And the way she moans almost imperceptibly without intention, as if clearing her throat to sing herself a lullaby. And that's the introduction to the hospital stories, which will eventually be animated as well as written in a book. So on top of writing stories, there's also a visual story, which I call visual sequencing. Even if it's a flat image, I need to know what comes before and one after. And that'll become more evident as I give this talk, why? And I've been doing sequencing for a very long time. This is probably from when I'm about seven or eight years old. Um, I have the complete story in my head. And here's a couple of uh, modern uh, strips from stories too, these three of them. The one at the top is make way, three wishes in the middle, and the bottom is an abstract floral piece. But again, I'm working with sequencing, images that come before an image and after. They inform what's going to be coming next. And I'd like to take a quick minute and just kind of go through a sequence piece with you, how visual and text work together. There's actually nine panels to this particular piece, but I want to discuss the first eight because they're the ones that are going to be most illustrative of what I'm trying to say. This particular story starts with the first lines, I should never have come back here. Nothing has changed. And the narrator of this story is the woman in panel three. The father in panel one is looking to the left. And the daughter in panel three is looking to the left, which is significant because we read from the left to the right. So anything going to the right feels correct to us. It feels like it's progressing forward. Anything going in the opposite direction foreshadows discontent or lines you up for something really isn't going to go right in the story. So right now, both these characters are separate and they're looking in the wrong direction, so they're not on the same page. Also look at the streak of orange and the green in the first couple of panels. The, str the strong orange comes forward during tension points in the story across the eight panels. When the green is more prevalent, that's when the story is more calm, more peaceful. Um, and so if you follow the woman through her, her uh, flashback memory to the house on panel number seven in the lower uh, strip, you'll see that the orange suddenly reappears back, except it's separate horizontally above the house, the house is in the middle, and the lily pad greens are on the bottom. And that's because this is where the tragedy, this is where this particular story, this, this uh, narrator, the woman's uh, childhood, uh, hit an issue with the father. And at that point, she realizes, because the father does something, even if it's very minor, to let her know he understands. So in the last panel, they're both together in the same panel. And I'll bring that up larger so that you can see what I'm talking about. They're both together in the last panel. They're both mirror imaging the same position unlike the two little pictures on the left when they're looking away the wrong direction. But even though they're together 
They're not touching. They're running in parallel to each other. So the end of this story ends up that there isn't a solution to the distance between them, but the distance has shortened, it's narrowed. It's they are now closer than they were at the beginning of the story. Again, using text and image to advance the story. I do this also with my animations. This particular one is an ice flow in the upper left-hand corner. The ice starts to break up. We go down through the first layer in the ocean of the fish, down through the krill, and deeper and deeper down into the depths of the ocean. And here is Surface Below with music by Nancy Tucker. So now that we have the written backstory, at least for myself as an artist in my head, and I have the visual sequencing, I kind of know where things are going to head. And of course, I don't have them exact. I always leave room for improvisation. The next thing I need to consider is the character itself. Now, I've been building characters for a very long time too. These are some of my early uh, figures and dolls that I used to do back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I wouldn't just create one image. I would take these uh, figures and I'd have them actually in tableaus where they were communicating with each other or talking with each other, uh, like a still shot uh, photograph. And I also studied puppetry for a very long time too, to figure out how these uh, 3D figures would move in space, how a hand would bend or what would be needed to uh, show an emotion by gesture. And yes, that's a ceramic puppet up above that I did. She's three feet tall. Um, When I ended up uh, going digital in 1981, I had the first version of Photoshop and uh, a bunch of other software um, without manuals. Uh, I started to transition all this early work that I had been doing in puppetry and dolls and story writing, et cetera, and sequencing into the computer. And I really love paper, which is kind of my first medium. Um, and so the type of characters and animations that I do are all based like paper dolls or paper puppets or shadow puppets. They're flat. And even if they look 3D, they're not. They're emulating 3D. So if you look at this bear on the left, you can see little circles in his palms and little circles on his shoulders and also on the inside joint of his elbow at his arm. These are all areas that this particular character can move. And I can do realistic characters too. And when we look at something like this, you know, we see it, we say, wow, this is amazing. It's so lifelike. Well, not really. Because if this character starts to move, it's pretty darn hard to look at the standing girl 
And that is because in our primitive brain, literally our hippocampus, going way back tens of thousands of years of human development, we have been hardwired to notice the shadow in the bush as it moved irregularly, quickly, and to say, is it a leaf or is it a lion ready to pounce on me? And so when something moves, we can't help but watch. And this is how a lot of puppetry is done. It works on this primitive reaction that we have to certain types of gestures in movements. And that hippocampus part of our brain overrides our rational brain to say, that's just a pile of wood with strings that a, a puppeteer is moving. Instead, we believe it's alive. Now, characters don't have to be people. and They don't have to have arms and legs either. They can actually be dots. These are two characters from an animation that I'll do in the future. The storyboard is all done. You'll see that in a little bit. Um, but the, on the left is the witch to Rapunzel. And on the right is Rapunzel herself self with her golden braided hair that she tosses in the fairy tale out the tower window. And here's the storyboard for the Rapunzel story. It's all just told in symbols, but it's how you have those symbols move, what backstory you know about that symbol so that you can anticipate the movement or gesture in the next frame. This will be one I do, I think, in the winter over three months. <laughs> These are a couple of character studies, again, non-human, abstract. But again, it's knowing their backstory, knowing how they move in space, knowing why they exist in their own story that inf informs the character's movements itself. Speaking of movement, now that we have the written story, the visual sequencing and character figured out, animations move. We all know they move. We all know that when we get up in the morning and we walk into the kitchen and make a cup of coffee, we moved from the bed to the kitchen. But do we really understand movement? I didn't. I didn't really understand movement until I start, took a community dance program uh, with uh, Palabalus uh, uh, Dance Theater. Uh, and it was also uh, offered through the ASAP After School Art Program in my town. Uh, the first program I did, I think it was in 2013 maybe, uh, was 16 weeks. We worked with the choreographers and dancers. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. I can't I emphasize this enough because I walked in with all my health issues, not being able to really walk with really without braces and things like that. And they said, I told them about my health issues and they said, what can you do? I said, I can do the queen's wave. That's just about it. And they said, we love you because we tell stories around improv and there's nothing better for improv than a challenge. And this is what this whole program was. They would show you a few ways to move without hurting yourself. Then they'd give you a topic and they'd say, you've got 10 minutes, make a story and dance, pair off with those five people, uh, have a beginning, a middle and an end to the dance. And you had 10 minutes. You'd be amazed what people came up with. I also had the experience to go in on one of their rehearsals with their dancers. And I was stunned to realize that as they are creating the dance, they are literally moving. So I'm sitting on the floor with my little sketch pad on the left and the dancers are going right over me. And I hear them talking, saying, oh yeah, just put your elbow there. Yeah, just fall down. Okay, I'll catch you there. Here, I'll throw you over there. And I couldn't believe they were improv in motion, in movement. This whole experience totally influenced my artwork, as you can see on the right. Even if I'm doing an animated character who has arms and legs and a head and a tail that's going to be moving in a particular way, there's a way of improving that movement so that it appears more naturally. 
And once I figure out that character in a rough sketch like this in vellum, these are how my drawings come into the computer, by the way, I have to figure out all the parts and pieces to that character that are going to move. And then we need to break down those uh, parts and pieces so that they overlap correctly and I'm not leaving a gap somewhere. This one here uh, has not been animated yet, but he's obviously ready to be animated. And here's a little bit more of a close up for you to see him blink and squint. And this is a character study for the nurses in those hospital stories. All the adult characters are going to be abstract. Only the children appear in realistically. Again, you can see all the little uh, circles on the knees and on the elbows. Uh, these are all places that this character can move. In fact, it's the same character that you're looking at. I've just moved those hinge points in many situations. So when you see something like this, that appears to be a painting, and even if it was a painting, what you have to understand is in my world, in my head, in my creative process, everything is moving. Everything has a story. It is actually going somewhere, even if it's a still image. This is an animation that Nancy and I worked on last fall. It's called Balancing the Needs of Human Invention with the Needs of Nature. I can only show you a few seconds of each of these uh, because uh, they're being entered and I can't have them up in full on the internet right now. They're entering in for uh, jurings. On this animation called Owl Moon, I want you to look at the wings that you see here. This is, this animation is about reflections in inner cities and how birds have difficulty sometimes navigating through our cities because of the reflections. So this particular frame that you see here is the man-made mechanical part of the reflection. Therefore, the wings sort of just move like a couple of boards. But in a few seconds, it's going to transition into an owl. And when you see this owl, the first thing you're going to look at is his head. And the second thing you're going to notice is the city that this owl is flying over. But I'd like you to also look at the outer green and white and black feather tips that you see on these wings, because it is that subtle movement of current of air that's actually supporting this owl to fly over the city, not the beat of a wing. And here we'll transition and notice the subtle movement of the feathers on the wings as the wind current supports this owl over Manhattan. Sometimes the least obvious is the most important in animation because it adds a depth of reality of, of weight or atmosphere uh, to the character or the atmospheric landscape that you're creating. These are a couple of still shots from a brand new uh, animation that Nancy and I are working on called Protostar. It's actually a three minute animation um, about the birth of a star, which actually in reality takes hundreds of thousands of years. But it starts as a gas of dust coming together and then slowly over time sort of sort of congealing into something sort of round and eventually it ends up a star with energy that can admit light. So I'm going to show you a few seconds of the animation of protostar. This is where the dust is coming together. And now the chemical reaction is working its magic within this particle dust and gases together. And slowly out of that reaction comes a semi together 
sort of spherical star still has a way to go before it would be a star we would recognize. And because I've just showed you six seconds here and 10 seconds there, which is frustrating because you can't see the whole animation, I'm gonna play this animation that Nancy and I did. I think we did this one in uh, 2021. Um, and it's called Curls into Autumn, again, with Nancy Tucker's beautiful guitar work. So the last area I'd like to talk to you about are worlds and landscapes. Because if I have the backstory and I have the visual sequencing in my head where that story is going, and I have the character and how that character is going to behave and how that character will move, they need to move and behave in a landscape or in a universe of its own. Now, like the film strip I showed you that I did at seven or eight years old, I've been building worlds a very long time. <laughs> I used to build these on the beach as a kid from six years old to about 11 or 12 years old. And these are about maybe 10 or 12 inches long by about five inches deep. And I would put these homesteads and landscapes and buildings up in the dunes, behind rocks, all over the place on the beach uh, that I was raised on as a child. And for me, it was a way of gifting to the world the, the joy of discovery that somebody could come along in like an archeology span dig, come over a rock horizon and look down and see a world uh, and wonder who lived in this tiny Lilliputian village. And I was doing that even at six years old. So let's bring this whole concept forward about 50 years. And I'm doing the same darn thing in my artwork digitally. This is flying over rooftops, across a river, sort of coming into the suburbs of a city. One's creative voice tends to get more sophisticated, but it really doesn't change <laughs> over a lifetime. We're still seeking that one elusive thing or two elusive things. So landscapes, where these characters are going to survive and live <clears throat> can be something like the neighborhoods that we would recognize with a house and you know an elm tree uh, covered lane. Or it could be a field where some animals live or some creatures or insects that we're basing the animation on. And we have to understand what all the, the temperatures are and the wind and how the wind behaves deep down in the grass versus being on the top of the grass and swaying along. So all these different elements come together. But I do not limit myself to think of a world as my world, the planet Earth. In terms of worlds, for me, the world is as large as a universe because I can take a bubble off the top of a lake in animation 
and have that bubble float right up to the stars and go up and have a cup of tea with the moon. So for me, worlds are not just planetary, they're universal, no matter how large and no matter how small. Even if I get them down to molecular atoms or nano, <laughs> nano parts way down, it's still a universe to that atom. It's still a universe to whatever is residing in that tiny, tiny uh, space. So again, I need to understand the story of that world and how that world behaves in order to animate it with a sense of truth. So when you see my flat artwork now, you're going to realize that there's actually in my head an image before and after. There's a story, the whole five different categories that I've been mentioning all along, right down to even tiny little microbes in the soil. There's still a story. There's still a world to discover in a flat piece of artwork. And if you do it right, if you end up with knowing the story, knowing how to visually sequence that story, knowing the movement and the character and the landscape that those elements exist in, then the animation has a chance to reside in the truest form of its own truth because every animation's truth is going to be different. So I'm gonna leave you with this particular world as a final joy of animation. <laughs> Again, the music was by Nancy Tucker. So I thank you for being here and listening to my talk. Um, I now have to I have to have control of my screen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Karen. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing in your multi-layered, fascinating beautiful world. Really, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we'll open it up now for questions. And maybe I can just start with one that is, interests me. Um, I'm interested in collaboration. And I'd like to know how you go about collaborating with Nancy. How, do, how does that work? Um, I start with a, a premise, an idea. Um, and I start to play around with objects and animated parts. And eventually, like I said, I get the backstory sort of um, and all those areas that I was talking about. But what I really want to emphasize is the muddled middle because I leave it really wide open in the middle because improvisation in the middle of an artwork, you can't plan it out. You just have to let it happen sometimes. So Nancy kind of gets a what would you say, Nancy, 75%, if that, 
animation mm -hmm. to start doing uh, music from, and then I pass it off to her. She does her amazing job with the sound, and then it comes back to me, and then we kind of go back and forth until we we tune it up. But originally, it's kind of like the two of us do our own thing. Great, thank you. I'd like to open it up now for any other questions that someone... Uh, no question, but I'd I like just... to open it up for... Yeah. Uh, it's not Sorry. a question. Excuse me. It's... It's okay. I just want to say to Karen how exquisite your work is and how stunningly gorgeous all of it in the microcosm and the macrocosm. Thank you. The Thank tiniest you. detail and in the largest composition. Really gorgeous. Really enjoyed it. I'm always thinking, you know, this could get projected larger and larger. <laughs> <laughs> and I want my file after all that work to last. So I'm kind of planning ahead a little bit um, for that reason. But, yeah, Cindy. Uh, Cynthia? Well, I too, like Renata, have a comment, not a question. Actually, I have several comments. First of all, I'm, I'm delighted to have seen uh, your work. Um, you take us from the personal to the universal, which is um, stunning. Um, I love watching your remarkable and hearing about your remarkable art journey from childhood to where you are now. I also enjoyed your wonderful blend of realism and abstraction. Um, you have produced worlds within worlds, uh, which is evident so, so many times in your work. Um, when I was watching the gyroscopic lullaby and hearing about your dealing with your own childhood health issues. I couldn't help but think of the uses of enchantment by Bruno Bettelheim, who talks about the role of fairy tales in our world and the importance of them. Um, and again, I, I can't say enough. The, 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 the description of how characters move is fascinating and it's obvious that you spend immeasurable amounts of time putting together these beautiful animations. So thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you so much for both your comments, Renata and Cindy. Um, they're both animators, so they, they understand what goes on under the hood, so to speak, <laughs> with the, this artwork. And, and the thing that I really do like about animation is, yeah, I have to be at the computer, but I don't have to be at the computer. You know, I can be outside observing a butterfly for movement. I can be at the beach looking how tides and ripples and sands and think of those as abstractions in an animation. So I can kind of, in a way, bring my universe to my universe, uh, which is what I really like about the uh, fine art animation field. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been making worlds for a long time. <laughs> I think I always wanted to just sort of take off in a rocket ship and just <laughs> explore the universe. <laughs> Great. Leona? I, um, I've never really understood animation and your presentation was so fascinating. Um, I couldn't stop smiling every now and again. It was being um, carried away um, with your imagination, the mystery, the magic. Uh, but I love process in art and understanding what went into creating the final pr product is really what fascinated and got me. And I, and I think the last piece was so exquisite because now I could look at all the various details and look at all the various layers and what went into creating the, the beauty, the magic. Um, it was absolutely exquisite. And um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Karen. And Nancy, your, your music. I mean, that to me is also fascinating. Um, you know, getting into the subject and feeling 
the uh, story and translating it or interpreting it in music. Um, I don't know whether you could talk a little bit about that bit. I love to write music um, and I've always wanted to have some visual to go with it. And when Karen asked me to start doing this, I was thrilled. And um, so the process of, of, um, of writing it, I just, it is a matter of feeling it, you know, it's trying to feel what it is she's trying to get across and, um, and also trying to get the rhythm right so that when things appear, there's some kind of music that goes with the appearance of whatever the form is that's coming into frame. Um, but I don't always have that, you know, she sometimes just sends me pictures, the still pictures. And from that, um, I really get a sense of what it is she's trying to do. And sometimes we just are in our separate corners. And when we put the music together with the visual, it just works and it's magic, you know? So, um, you know, I, I also work with Marlo on on, on uh, animations, and um, I don't know. There's just nothing like it. Could I? Uh, you can add something. Well, I that. just wanted to comment. Number one, I've I've known Karen since well college. We were at university together at art school. They were a year ahead of me. They they took me in when they saw how crazy the dorms were making me, and we <laughs> had an apartment. But I, I have to say, um, I can't. I don't want to be redundant. I was just struck with the beauty of your work and also your trajectory and how your difficult beginning really helped you focus your expertise and observation skills and uh, interest in science. I just, that was wonderful. And to the music and animation, I know it's happened with you, Karen, and it's happened with me a few times where Nancy has actually composed a piece. I'll say, uh, I'm going to do something about whatever, give me about a minute and a half. <laughs> I put it into the animation and sometimes I don't have to change a thing. So I believe there's something going on on another level that we haven't yet <laughs> learned about. <laughs> I agree, yeah. totally agree. Um, but Nancy has always, uh, all her, her music, because uh, you, you did stage performances too and stuff, right? I mean, almost theatrical stage things. And so you bring a lot of theater to your music, even in the way you present the music, even if it's a, a somber, quiet piece, it, it has a character to itself, uh, I find, with, with your music, you know, which is fun to pair up with the visuals. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's but when you say there's a different level, it, is it the fact that the three of you all have been together from college and you all have been close friends and really know each other in a way that makes this uh, collaboration so seamless and cohesive? Can I say something? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say um, there. I think that when we set our intention to something, because I've taken various uh, classes uh, with people who are entire strangers, never met them before. And sometimes we'll all arrive to the room where the conference is going on and 90% of us have the same color on. I mean, there's something about intention and focus. And if, if people, strangers or friends have that intention, things happen. So, yeah. yeah. I don't, I have not known Karen as long as I've known Marlo. Um, but maybe because Marlo knew Karen all those years, there's some kind of cellular thing, you know? I don't know. <laughs> we won't get into that Woodstock era. <laughs> How the chemistries might have changed. <laughs> um, Thank you. But I've known Nancy, gosh, not, not just recently. We've known each other for over 20 years. 20, really? Well, yeah. we, I haven't been alive that long. No, 30, 36 <laughs> years. So, yeah, at least 36 years, Karen, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to say about this music, and when Nancy's, you know, sort of like, she gives me the final draft of the music here or there. We might have to add a few little beats at the end or something, but pretty much it's sort of 
together. She'll give me like one little snippet, little teeny 10 second snippet. And when it comes in, it's like candy. It's like, oh, I can't wait. Mm -hmm. There's something magic about putting the visual and the sound together that does create an extra dimension that at least my brain can't think how or imagine how that's going to affect each other. So it's kind of like this invisible space and then they come together and I'm sure Marlo and Renata, you've done the same thing, although I know Renata composes her own music where you just hit a spot in the music with a visual and you go, wow, <laughs> had no idea that was going to happen, but I'll take it. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank um, you, Karen, for this incredible presentation. Give us the insight of your brain. You know, and your and your own universe, and that's why I like the fact about the, you know, the inspiration art group is we have a platform, and to bring in all those excellent creative artists to showcase their work, and each one of our artists and our mem member members artists are excellent in their own way. And they all, you know, artists, it's like they have own little universe mm -hmm. in them, you know? We just get a glimpse of them each, and it's just wonderful. And Mara is going to do her presentation, portfolio presentation, in June. And that will be the first Wednesday in June. And we hope that Nancy will repeat her presentation sometime soon, too. And if anybody out there is in our group, want to do a presentation and can email me and we can talk about that. And, and that, the website is inspirationartgroup.org. Yeah, here you have the, yeah, whatever and that and is called. Thank you. Uh, we'll we'll always one more do that. We have one more question coming in um, from Mimi Graminski. Um, can, Karen, can you say a little bit more about your large projections? Well, I've had a couple of opportunities uh, to see them on a grander scale than my computer screen. I've obviously seen them uh, on larger, you know, 60 inch monitors and things like that, which is like really cool. The largest one I have here now is a 42. I used to have a 52. Um, but in other venues, they can be 60, 65. Uh, but the video wall was six feet by six feet. And that was really interesting because you begin to realize projection distances, you know, so what looks good on your computer screen uh, has to hold up 60, 80 feet away. Um, and so sometimes it's a matter of tweaking values, uh, et cetera. But I, I mean, I don't change it for the venue, but if I'm building something for a larger venue, I may ramp up the values and, and the, uh, the actual structures themselves. Uh, I've also had it projected uh, in the Mocha Lights uh, uh, projection festival uh, down in Long Island. Um, and uh, my work was on a 60 foot building. And then also on the marquee on their theater. So that was an interesting format to see too. So, uh, and I've the children's literature conference, their screen is about 25 feet across. And the first one I did for them, uh, Nancy did the music for that one too. Uh, there's this sort of a beast character that fills the whole screen. At one point he sort of hisses and growls. And I walked into the auditorium just as that was happening, 25 feet across. <laughs> And the whole audience like cheered. So it was kind of fun to see that little creature who was only five inches on my screen be 20 feet across. Wow. So, you. Uh, you know, digital art uh, animators, fine art animators, uh, you know, that work with animation and projections, we're always looking for venues mm -hmm. to screen these uh, artwork on. Great. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, that about wraps it up. Thanks again, Karen. That was really cool. And uh, look forward to the next presentation, which will be, Bibiana, when is it going to be exactly? It's in two months. Yes, it will be date? June. First Wednesday in June, and that will be the June 7th. June 7th. Great. Yes. At uh, 1 o'clock, right? Yes, at okay, 1 o'clock. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you.
Hi, Thank everybody, you. too, for being okay. here for my presentation. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. And then we all disappeared.